Okay, so this is the uh, famous sutta on the characteristics of not-self. Uh, and uh, it is found both in the suttas and also in the Vinaya Pitaka. And that often means that it is considered uh, an important discourse because uh, uh, sometimes, you know, the way that the ancient uh, Indians, how they memorized the suttas, they were so-called Banakas. And a Banaka is a reciter of the suttas. Uh, and they were divided into groups. And so there would be reciters who... Uh, did the diga, the long discourses, reciters that did the majjhima, the middle length discourses, uh, and etc., etc. And then there were reciters who did the vinaya pitaka. And so every reciter group should have some core suttas as part of what they recited, uh, that they could understand the dhamma properly. Uh, yeah. So the, so the fact that these are found both in the uh, sangyutta nikaya, the connected discourses, and also in the vinaya means that it's kind of been probably been duplicated a bit to give everyone some nice profound discourses to reflect on her. This is the Anatta Lakkana Sutta, the characteristics of non-self, and one of the most interesting suttas uh, about non-self. And uh, as Abraham told me that uh, when he went on, on his six-month retreat, this was one of the main suttas that he contemplated uh, during his six-month retreat. Uh, it's kind of interesting here. Yeah. And you can... Uh, no, you, no, you can't. Sorry. <laughs> so uh, let's see what this sutta has to say. At one time, the Buddha was staying near Benares, or Varanasi, in the deer park at Isipatana. There, the Buddha addressed the group of five mendicants. Yeah, so the um, background story here, of course, is that the Buddha uh, became awakened just uh, uh, fairly recently before this. And after his awakening, he had to decide who he was going to teach first. And so he reflected on his old teachers, and they had already passed away. The Alara Kalama and Udrakarma Buddha, they passed away, couldn't teach them because they were chilling out in some kind of devaloka. And then he thought about the five mendicants, the group of five, yeah, who had supported him before. It's kind of interesting the way the Buddha thinks. Yeah? He, straight away he thinks about who has helped me. I will help them back. And yeah? that's kind of how he thinks. So he starts with Alara Ka. Alara, Kalama, and Udra because they were his first teachers. And then he thinks of the group of five who also were supporting him. Yeah? So it's fascinating. The mind of the Buddha also revolves around the same kind of good qualities of, uh, or gratitude and uh, thankfulness. So. so then he walks all the way, presumably from the place of awakening, all the way to Varanasi. And those of you who have traveled in India will know that's a long way. So it would have taken him probably several weeks. Uh, to get there, and then he comes to the deer park. Yeah, this is just outside of the city of Anasi. You can go there in the present day. It's a very beautiful place, very serene place. Uh, and then he meets the group of five. And first of all, they kind of refuse to have anything to do with him. Yeah, he said, "You, you, you backslider." That's what I said to him. "You backslider. Yeah, you, you used to practice properly. You didn't eat, and you took solid food. That's considered bad. Yeah, what? We are not going to support anyone who takes solid food." Yeah? And this was like, this is what I mean by the Buddha going against all the um, everything that was accepted in ancient India. If you were a real spiritual seeker in those days, you didn't eat, yeah, or you ate so little that you almost died. And if you took food, you were considered a, kind of a luxurious and uh, and backsliding. And so they didn't want to have anything to do with him. And then the Buddha tells them, "Well, listen, uh, you know, I have." reached awakening or whatever. Have you ever heard me speak like this before? And then he's able to convince them. And then he gives them the uh, uh, the um, uh, Dhamma Chakka Pavatana Sutta, the setting in motion, the wheel of the Dhamma, is a Sutta that he then gives. Uh, and then that is when Kandanya becomes a, a stream mentor. And then later on they practice together. And when they practice together, eventually he gives the second discourse. And that is the, this discourse we have now, the Anatalakana Sutta. And so they start with the Dhamma Chakka, then the Anatilakana Sutta. And this obviously, this takes a bit of time. So things are happening in the meantime. Yeah, we shouldn't think of this as happening too quickly because uh, it takes practice, it takes instructions. Uh, but uh, at some point, this discourse was then spoken to the group of five mendicants. Uh, mendicants, Venerable Sir, they replied, and the Buddha said this. Uh, Mendicant's form, yeah, or appearance, if you like, is not self. For if form were self, it wouldn't lead to affliction. Yeah, so this is um, the starting 
point here. Mm -hmm. uh, form is not self. Uh, why? Because if form were self, uh, uh, it wouldn't lead to affliction. Uh, and the idea here is that, uh, first of all, the, the way that a self was defined at that time, everyone agreed that a self is happy. Not only is it happy, it is permanent. Yeah? It is stable and happy. This is how the, um, uh, the Brahmanical religion defines the idea of Brahman and Atman. Yeah, it, is a, it is often sometimes called Satchit Ananda. Sat is existing, Chit is mind, Ananda is bliss. The existing mind bliss uh, is kind of the idea of the self. And so anything which is suffering, by definition, cannot be a self. Uh, because uh, form always leads to suffering. Yeah? Form, appearance... Uh, Leads to suffering, why it changes, and anything. Oh no, my form, my appearance is changing. I'm getting old now, it's all falling apart and really kind of difficult. Uh, yeah? And then it leads to affliction. Uh, this is the nature of all form, all appearance, all shapes in the world. Uh, they're out of control. So, this is the, uh, what's going on here. Uh, and then the out of control part comes up. Uh, if you could compel form, uh, May my form be, and you could, sorry, and you could compel form, may my form be like this, may it not be like that. Yeah, the idea of a self is the idea that you are in charge. A self is something that is under your control because it is you. Yeah, you can do whatever you like with yourself. And so you, if the body or the form or your appearance is uh, yourself, then you can control it. You can say, may you be young forever after. Yeah. 20, how, what is the perfect age? I don't know. Uh, not sure. Uh, whatever age you like. Uh, and you bang, that's where you are. Uh, and the devatas apparently are a bit like that. They say they are by around 25 years old, yeah, for, for as long as they uh, are devatas. Uh, and then one day they just disappear. Bang, gone. Uh, so uh, it seems good, uh, but even that is also impermanent. Uh, so you cannot have your form be like this. Uh, yeah, you cannot say, I will forever be 25. Is that the best age or is it not 25? 26? <laughs> I don't know. Something like that, yeah? Um, may it not be like that? Actually, I don't know if 25. That's too young, right? I mean, you don't really understand the world properly. You're kind of at your wit's end when you're 25. 35 is better? Yeah, maybe 35 is probably better, right? I would tend to agree with you there. Or it's kind of a, yeah, anyway, eh, whatever, we'll stop, we'll stop messing around. So, <laughs> so you cannot have it like this, nor can you stop it from becoming otherwise. Yeah? And nor may it not be like that, may it not be old and decrepit and falling apart. Yeah? So you, have, you don't control it. So the essence of a self is something that you can control, something that you are in charge of. Something that is happy, permanent, and that you are in charge of. This is the ideas of a, of a self. Um, but because form is not self, yeah, because it is you are not under your control, because it is subject to causes and conditions. Causes and conditions are the main things that uh, are, you know, your um, what happens to your body and to your appearance and everything. Yeah? It leads to affliction. Because cause and conditions do things contrary to how you want them to be. You want them to be one way. Cause and conditions say, ha, ha, ha I'm going to lead a different way. Yeah. That's what they say. Yeah. And you can't compel form. May my form be like this. Uh, may it not be like that. Uh, so you have a little bit of control over your form. Yeah? You, kind of, you, you try your best to sort of uh, hold it together. Uh, yeah? But uh, in the end, uh, nature always wins. Uh, and there is nothing really you can do about it at the end of the day. Uh, and so the little bit of control, that control, in a sense, is just another set of cause and conditions. It doesn't mean you are in control. That too is actually cause and conditions. But this is the craving that tries to control. And uh, of course, that craving is, uh, is, uh, is just one cause and conditions among many, and eventually it will lose out. Does it make sense to everyone? Yeah? A little bit of sense? Yeah? Not complete, complete sense. If it was complete sense, it means you are already uh, way doing really well. Huh? So this is the idea of form. Okay. Feeling is not self. Uh, for if feeling were self, it wouldn't lead to affliction. Uh, and you could compel feeling, 
may my feeling be like this, may it not be like that. Uh, yeah, so uh, it leads to a friction because eventually you feel pain, eventually you feel things that you don't want to feel. Uh, uh, even if you feel really happy, sometimes the happiness will decline. That's already a friction. If you have lots of happiness, then you have less happiness. Uh, and you can't control the feelings again. Yeah, you can't. Uh, if you try to sit down and you try to meditate uh, and you sit down for more than 10 minutes, you start to have a little bit of pain in your legs or your back or your whatever it is. Uh, yeah, it's just the, the nature of the body. It is always irritating. Yeah? And uh, so, and you cannot really change that. Uh, it will forever be like that. Uh, that is just the way the body is. It doesn't matter how many cushions you have. Uh, it doesn't matter how comfortable your chair is. Uh, you still have to move. Uh, uh, even when you sleep on a really beautiful and soft bed, you still have to twist and turn in bed at night, uh, regardless of uh, how nice everything is. Uh, the only way to have a nice body is to get rid of the body. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> that happens when you, when, when you die and you go to the Devaloka, that's when you kind of you, you have a better, much better body. So this is the problem with the feelings. Feelings just come and go out of control. Then you get reborn in one realm, then you get reborn in another realm. Huh? Yeah? Is always moving around. Uh, life is so uncertain. You never know what's going to happen around the corner. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen with the world. You don't know what's going to happen in your life. Feelings are just so utterly unpredictable. It is not just the body, but it's feelings in general. Mental feelings. Feelings of sorrow and problems yeah, afflicts everyone in this world. Uh, feelings are out of control. Uh, yes, you can have a little bit of coffee. And yes, that helps a little bit, but only a tiny bit. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, but because feelings, feeling is not self, it leads to affliction because it changes when you don't want it to change. And you can't, you can't compel feeling. May my feelings be like this, may it not be like that. Perception is not self, for if perception were self, it wouldn't lead to affliction. And you could compel perception. May my perception be like this, uh, may it not be like that. Uh, so uh, perception is changeable. Uh, friends become enemies. Uh, enemies become friends. Uh, yeah, the um, uh, seeing things kind of crumbling around you can often be, be an uh, unpleasant perception. Uh, however you perceive the world, uh, as uh, stable, as, as, uh, as nice, as friendly, and it changes around and things become less stable and less friendly than they used to be. Uh, uh, nothing really holding on. We tend to hold on to certain ideas and ways the world should be, how life should be. Uh, and these perceptions themselves get challenged by the reality of the world, uh, which always undermines everything we try to hold on to. Uh, so you cannot say, may my perceptions be like this, may they be like that, uh, because uh, uh, reality always undermines uh, what we hold on to. Uh, and because perception is not self, it leads to affliction. Uh, and you can't, you can't compel your perceptions. May my perception be like this. Uh, may it not be like that. Uh, hmm. Then we come to choices. Uh, Choices are not self. Uh, this is like the, um, the will. Yeah? The will is not self. Intentions are not self. Uh, for if choices were self, they wouldn't lead to affliction. Uh, and you could compel choices. May my choices be like this. Uh, may they not be like that. Uh, so what does it mean that choices lead to affliction? Uh, well, it means can mean many things. It can mean a number of things here. It can mean that uh, uh, sometimes we uh, we don't understand the choices that we make, yeah, and they kind of lead us astray, yeah? and they lead us to suffering down the track. Yeah? We make bad choices. Uh, we think that we are acting in a way that is uh, wise. We think that we have good intentions, uh, but actually, it turns out that we don't really know what we're doing. Yeah? So, cho our choices often lead to affliction. They don't, don't know what they are. Uh, or it could be that uh, choices themselves, in the idea that the uh, the movement of the mind, the uh, creativity of the mind, all of that is actually painful compared to peace. Uh, yeah. So choices are actually lead to affliction just by their very nature. They are afflictive, uh, and this is also another problem. Uh, 
And then comes the interesting thing here, yeah? Can you compel choices? May my choices be like this? Uh, may they not be like that? Uh, so you could compel, you could choose your choices. Uh, this is what this is saying. You could choose your choices, uh, but you cannot choose your choices. Uh, your choices are a result of causes and conditions. They're not a result of your choices. Uh, so the choices you have are a conditioned thing. Uh, yeah? So in other words, our will is not free. Yeah? Our, our will, our intentions arise because of certain causes and conditions. Uh, if you like noodles, it's because, not because you, that is your free choice. If I like salmon, it's not because of my free choice, uh, because it's been conditioned into us. Yeah? We choose noodles and salmon because of certain causes and conditions in the past. Uh, that is how it is. You don't choose those choices. Uh, they are kind of drilled into you. Why are you a Buddhist? Because you chose, you chose to be a Buddhist, but where did that choice come from? Cause and conditions. And so this is kind of the idea here of uh, choices being, uh, choices are being made for us, if you like. Uh, yeah? Something else is making the choices. Uh, not someone else, but something else. Uh, the cause and conditions of the world. Uh. But because choices are not self, they lead to affliction. You can't compel your choices. May my choices be like this. May they not be like that. Yeah, if you could compel your choices, you would say, I will always choose to be kind. And then you try, you can't do it. I will always choose to think thoughts of compassion. And then you can't do it. Why? Because cause and condition says, we are not going to allow you. We are going to take your choices in a different direction. We are going to force you to choose bad things. And then you choose bad things because uh, the cause and conditions tell you that is, that's what you must do. Uh, and so cause and conditions are more powerful than uh, uh, that is actually what runs the whole game. And so we have to follow along that game. This is the idea, the Buddhist idea of a uh, lack of freedom of the will. The will is uh, uh, caused and conditioned. This is one of the best examples, I think, of... Uh, why the will is not free in the suttas is actually that particular paragraph right there. Consciousness is not self, for if consciousness were self, it wouldn't lead to affliction. And you could compel consciousness, may my consciousness be like this, may it not be like that. So uh, consciousness leads to affliction. Yeah, I guess consciousness... Uh, kind of leads to, I'm not sure exactly what it means in this particular case, but uh, it leads to rebirth, uh, it leads to affliction in this life, its very existence is a kind of affliction. Uh, there is various kinds of consciousness, some of those consciousnesses are afflictive, uh, and so ultimately consciousness is, uh, is an affliction, and that's why it is a problem. May my consciousness be like this, it may not be like that, again, you can't have it that way. Uh, you know, may I just... Uh, be still in samadhi all the time, and you can't have it. You're still in samadhi all the time. Yeah? You have to come out of that samadhi. That is a kind of specific mind consciousness that you cannot always have. And so you are, you are compelled. Even if you don't want to see anything, you have to see things. And that is what this means. So um, consciousness is not self. You cannot compel the, the consciousness to be in a particular way. So uh, it is not self, it leads to affliction, uh, and you can't compel consciousness. May it be like this, may it not be like that. It will also go according to causes and conditions. When you come out of samadhi, you will have to hear sound conscious, ear consciousness will arise, uh, whether you want to or not. Uh, and uh, even though you probably don't want to, there it is. Uh. So this is the uh, kind of the, the starting point of the uh, Atalakana Sutta. The idea how everything really is out of control. This is what this is saying. Yeah? Everything arises out of cause and conditions. Yeah? There is no one, no one is in charge. Nothing is in charge inside of us. Uh, even though it feels like we are in charge, uh, this is one of those great illusions of uh, the sense of self. And this is why the sense of self is so pernicious. Uh, this is why it is so bad. This is why it is problematic. Yeah? Because it tells you that you're in charge when you are not. Uh, and because of that, you try to control the world. And when you try to control the world, you mess it up. Yeah, because it can't be controlled. As you can see how this leads to a lot of problems. So when you try to control that which actually is out of control. Relax. Everything is out of control. 
That's not old saying. It's a nice one there. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So this is the, uh, the starting point of this uh, particular sutta. Now we, let's come to the second part. It's kind of divided up into three parts, this sutta. This is part number one. Uh, part number two. What do you think, mendicants? Uh, is form permanent or is it impermanent? Uh, impermanent, sir. Uh, so, um, form, yeah, per, is, is impermanent, obviously. Uh, we can see that all forms around us, including ourselves, we are impermanent. Uh, we are out of control. Uh, um, yeah, things are just problematic uh, and things are always changing. Uh, nothing is stable. Uh, nothing can be, and it's, so it's unreliable and it's uncertain. Uh, and all of these things are obviously bad. Uh, things that we cannot rely on are bad. So uh, form is impermanent. Uh, what then? But if it is impermanent, is it suffering or happiness? Uh, it is suffering because it means it's out of control. And we always want to control things, uh, but you can't have it. Uh, and therefore, it must be suffering. Uh, sometimes we hear people say that, ah, it's not always suffering because sometimes if, if suffering is impermanent, it means you become happy afterwards. In that case, suffering impermanence is good, yeah, because you go from suffering to happiness. Uh, but uh, the problem with that argument is that it means that you are suffering in the first place. Uh, yeah, so it, can't, it doesn't really help very much. Yes, sometimes impermanence is, takes you out of suffering, uh, but that means you're already suffering. So the problem is already there. Firstly. Secondly, sometimes you identify with that suffering. Uh, you know that? Uh, yeah, people often ad sometimes identify with the suffering. Uh, sometimes people are kind of sad, they have lost somebody, and they don't want to come out of the sadness. They identify with the sadness. I am the sad person. And I don't want to be uh, taken out of it. Uh, Ajahn Brahm tells a story. I think he, he was giving a talk at the Cancer Support Association in uh, Perth. Uh, and he was saying to people, you know, actually you don't necessarily have to be sad. Uh, and afterwards, this lady came up to him, don't you dare to take away my sadness. <laughs> <laughs> And he was, I think I was a bit shocked, you know. <laughs> what, what, and, you know. So uh, sometimes we identify so deeply with the suffering, we become the suffering. Uh, and then that is another reason why uh, impermanence is, uh, is a problem, even if you are suffering already. And then comes the, uh, the last one. But if it is impermanent, suffering and perishable, is it fit to be regarded thus? This is mine, I am this, this is myself. No, sir. So here you see, if anything is impermanent or suffering or perishable, then should it be regarded in this way? And the answer is no. And this is the uh, three, again, the three things that lead to papancha. Yeah? This is craving, uh, this is the conceit I am, and this is views uh, that you see right there that we talked about from the very beginning when we talk about papancha. So nothing should be regarded in this way. It means that you are no more papancha, because all the causes of papancha are uprooted if you see things in this way. So, uh, and this is a deep insight. I mean, you, you probably can see superficially what this means, but uh, seeing it superficially is not the same as fully comprehending what it is about. Uh, that happens only through insight. Uh, so you have some idea what this is about, but only some idea. So... Uh, um, yeah, again, this goes against the idea of a self. The a self is always happy and permanent. Uh, and uh, if you look at yourself and the things that you take to be the real you inside, it would usually be the real you is something that is happy and it has some sort of lasting feeling to it. Uh, that is what the self, the full sense of self feels like. Uh, and that self business, it is not mine. Yeah, You don't own it. Uh, uh, we're talking about the five khandas here, so there's no ownership of that. Uh, usually when we talk about form, it's more like ownership. Uh, I am this, this is a con this concerned with uh, the conceit. So I am is like you are identifying with one of the um, uh, khandas usually. And the last one, this is myself, this is a view, yeah, uh, self, and it becomes much more solidified, a specific thing what it actually is. This is the self, this is, this is the solid part. Very often when we say, I am this, it's kind of a bit unclear what it refers to. But the moment you say, this is myself, then it's kind of very strongly um, 
uh, can very strongly defined in a sense. Uh, so these are the three kinds of uh, uh, papancha causes, uh, sources. Uh, no, sir. So, next one. Is feeling permanent or impermanent? Yeah, same thing again. Same go through feelings. They are also impermanent. They are also unreliable. They are suffering. So ultimately, feelings are also non-self. You cannot have any feeling forever and ever. Feelings are always changing very, very fast. Perceptions are always changing. Nothing is lasting. Everything in the world is moving, and so perceptions cannot possibly last. Choices are permanent. Well, choices are different. Yeah, you, some, sometimes you have certain choices, other times you make other choices, depending on the cause and conditions around you. And sometimes we change completely what is important to us in the world, what we, uh, the choices that we make change, uh, and also choices uh, uh, cease gradually during meditation practice itself. Uh, so they are uh, impermanent, uh, and they are definitely suffering. Yeah? Choosing is suffering. Uh, if you have too many choices, you have choice paralysis. Uh, that is suffering. Yeah? Yeah, you go to, you, have you been to the United States? You go to the United States, you go to these restaurants, and you can have choose 200, 100 different sources, 200 different kind of this and that, uh, and you don't know what to do. Yeah, you completely, I'm, I'm from a different country, I don't understand so many choices. Please, make it simple for me. Just put something on, <laughs> give me something, and I'll be, I'll be happy. Yeah. It's just it, anything randomly is more happiness than having to make all those choices. Uh, so, um, choice... Choices are, are suffering in that sense, uh, is, is that sometimes it's much better to just, to, just to be the, the knower than the doer in the world. Uh, is consciousness permanent or impermanent? Uh, impermanent, sir. Uh, yeah, consciousness changes. The eye consciousness disappears, then you hear the eye, the ear consciousness, then you go to the mind consciousness, uh, then you go into a state of samadhi, the five sense consciousness are gone, uh, moving around. Consciousness is never stable. Uh, it's very hard to see because it moves so fast. Uh, and the mind consciousness is always there in the middle, uh, creating the sense of permanency. Uh, huh. It's good, isn't it? Uh, I'm almost directly under the icon. Uh, that's kind of the... <laughs> Did you do that on purpose, uh, Bobby? But yeah, okay. It's very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very, very kind of you. Now. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, feeling is impermanent. Now the cold air coming, then it stops a little bit and it comes again. And the feeling is impermanent. Yeah. <laughs> so um, consciousness is impermanent, yeah? And, uh, uh, but if it is impermanent, is it suffering or happiness? Uh, it is suffering, sir. Yeah? You can't control it. You can't have it when you want. Uh, and things disappear, they go, and then they, they come again. Uh, but if it is impermanent, suffering, and perishable, is it fit to be regarded thus? This is mine. I am this. This is myself. No, sir. So even consciousness itself cannot be regarded as mine. Of course, very often here, this is, uh, it, we don't usually think of consciousness as mine. We think of it as I am this. Yeah? This is kind of the, um, uh, the problem with consciousness. It's very difficult not to take that as the real you. So you will identify with consciousness in the same way that you identify with choices. That was just the previous one. I forgot to mention that. Uh, these are the two main areas where we tend to identify because it's so fundamental to our experience of the world, uh, just being aware and, and choosing things. Uh, and so, but actually, it turns out when you start, and this is why deep meditation is so important, because seeing the impermanence of these things, uh, seeing how choices kind of gradually disappears, uh, seeing that consciousness itself is impermanent, uh, yeah, moving from one sense uh, field to another one is very difficult to see. Uh, it feels like there is a continuity there, but the continuity turns out to be an illusion. Uh, and so uh, even though the, we may agree with the Buddha, actually knowing this actually is quite difficult. Uh, but all you have to do is to see it, and once you see it, bang, the insight comes, and then you let go, of course, as a consequence. But a uh, very powerful mind is required. This is one of the reasons why samadhi is such an important aspect of the path, because it lives, gives you that power of the mind that enables you to see these profound truths from the point of view of the, uh, the Buddha. So even consciousness is, uh, 
uh, this is mine, I am this, this is myself, is actually a false view. So the answer is no, sir. So, let's do a little bit more meditation again now. Okay, so please, anyone there, if you have any um, comments or questions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, sir, normally the Anatta is its not just the five Khandas. In Giri Mananda Sutta, we had the Chaku, ah. Anatta, yeah. Kaya Anatta. Yeah, exactly. There's so, different ways of looking at it. Uh, There's two uh, ways. Yeah. Is there more? Probably is. Probably is endless number of ways. I guess it depends on how you want to divide up the human mind and body. You can divide it up into vertically, this way, horizontally, uh, 20 to 30 degrees, you know. <laughs> So but I think yeah, five khandas and six senses are, are fairly natural ways of dividing it because it's easy to relate to that, you know. Um, but there, potentially there are other ways of doing it as well, like the, maybe the six uh, daughters, uh, yeah, another way, maybe a way of doing it. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, Ajahn, I just have a comment. You mentioned about that lady screaming at uh, Ajahn Pram about uh, her suffering. Uh, uh yeah, there's a famous saying by Venerable Tignat Han. Yeah. It says people have a hard time letting go of their suffering. Out of a fear of the unknown, they prefer their suffering <laughs> that is familiar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think that's very true. That's true, isn't it? Uh, yeah. And uh, it it goes in many ways. I mean, one uh, one thing is that um uh, you know, one thing is that kind of the obvious suffering, like being depressed and sad and kind of taking that as a self. Uh, but it is also the reality that so much of the other things in life are actually suffering. And uh, sometimes we don't really want to know that it is, uh, that is the case. Uh, we would rather kind of have the familiarity of our ordinary life. There's actually many, many things in life for, for which that is true, uh, you know. Like, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Ajahn Brahm has a, one of the, his nice stories. If you read the... Um, Opening door of your heart. The last one is a truck, the not the truck or dung, but the one with the, the the worm and its lovely pile of dung. Yeah. You know that story, uh, Billy? Yeah. Don't know that story? Wow, you have a, you have missed out. <laughs> okay, so the, the worm and its lovely pile of dung is the is a story of like two brothers or two 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 monks who were friends or whatever it was. Uh, two people, yeah, who uh, probably made monks who were friends. And one monk was a really good monk and he got, uh, he got reborn in heaven afterwards. And the other one was a bit dodgy monk and he got reborn as a worm and a pile of dung. Yeah, dung, really kind of filthy dung. Yeah? And then the, uh, the kind of the, 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 the brother who got reborn in heaven, uh, he looks down and he says, wow, my brother reborn in a pile of dung. That's terrible. Let me help him. Yeah? And so he goes down to his brother and he kind of stretches out his heavenly arm and the little kind of worm kind of looks up at his heavenly arm and he says, go away. <laughs> and he says, I'm trying to help you. Yeah, I'm a heavenly being. You know, up here, everything is so nice and you are living in a pile of, well, there's many words for that, but let's call it dung. Yeah? <laughs> You're living in a pile of dung. You know, what, what are you doing? You know, come with me to heavenly realm. And the worm says, leave me alone, go away. My dung is nice and warm and I can eat it nice and kind of you, nice kind of a feeling and all this kind of thing. Go away. And so the heavenly being gets a bit exasperated, tries to pull him out of the pile of dung. Yeah? And he refuses and he kind of wiggles back into the pile of dung. Yeah? And to cut a long story short, eventually the heavenly being gives up. It's impossible to get this worm to give, to give up on this pile of dung, yeah? on this dukkha, holding on to dukkha for hard life. And uh, Ajahn Brahm, of course, the idea here is that uh, human beings, we're all in a, a pile of dungs, you know, uh, and the Buddha is trying to pull us out, uh, but he can't. We are clinging on to the pile of dung, yeah? or the Buddha is pulling as hard as he possibly can, but we cling on uh, to the dung of life. Uh, that is kind of the idea there. Yeah? <laughs> it's a nice story, and I think there's a lot of truth to it, you know. That's kind of how it works. Uh. All right. Um. Um, Ajahn, yes. my question is on the practice of loving kindness as yeah. well. So um, in the uh, Atakanagara Sutta, yeah. so loving kindness is considered one of the 11 portals to the deathless. Mm. And um, how one attains that is um, that the 
Yogi should consider thus that even this mental liberation by loving kindness is constructed, it's uh, intentionally formed. Yeah. And anything that is intentionally formed is subject to impermanence. So if he study therein, he attains the destruction of the mental influxes. So when we do our regular loving kindness meditation, yeah. um, do we need to bring, incline our mind towards that, that kind of, um, you know, opening our eyes to experientially verifying impermanence yeah. through loving um, kindness? Or how do you suggest uh, incorporate this? If, if your loving kindness is really, really profound, yeah, so profound that you kind of go to the jhana level or beyond, uh, then you can do that. Uh, uh, if not, it's probably, for most people, it's probably a bit too early to incline towards those things. Uh, uh, but what you can do, you can incline it a little bit towards insight. Uh, you know, the similar kind of ideas that we looked at in the Anapanasati Sutta, Mindfulness of Breathing Sutta. What is missing? Yeah. yeah. How does it feel when that is missing? You know, and then you can see, see a little bit of impermanence and suffering through that kind of contemplation. If something is gone, obviously it's impermanent. If something is gone and you feel better, that was obviously suffering. Yeah. So you can have some ideas through kind of simple contemplation like that. Uh, but don't try to kind of jump the gun, as they say, and they kind of, you know, probably going a little bit too far to, to have this kind of insight because this refers to very, very profound uh, experiences of, uh, of loving kindness, uh, yeah, where you basically the mind is leaving the five senses behind and you're entering a different reality or something. Yeah. So, yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, Ajahn Brahm likes to tra uh, translate the consciousness as consciousnesses. He, yeah. he, he keeps emphasizing plural rather than singular. So what's, what's right. Your, yeah. Yeah. What's your comment on that? <laughs> Well, my, my comment is that yes, and that, that's kind of the point, the point of it, that uh, some consciousness can cease while others remain, and that's kind of the point. Uh, but the reason why it is uh, uh, singular here is because the Pali actually is singular here. So, uh, so that's kind of why we tend to read it as singular here. But yes, it is. I think it is a very interesting point that he makes, for sure. Oh, yeah. so, I mean, he keeps referring to the, uh, the six consciousnesses. Yeah. I mean, it's the eye consciousness, ear consciousness. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's not like one thing or one consciousness is consciousness is it's, yeah. it's, it's not like it's one one kind of consciousness or something yeah. like that. in the suttas it's usually called the the six classes of consciousness uh, the cha vinyana kaya that's the usual term for that in the suttas uh, and uh, so that's how it is how it is often defined uh, absolutely yeah. so uh, yeah <laughs> okay uh, yeah, sorry, Ajahn, just one more question. Yeah. So what, what is your opinion on the Heart Sutra, like, you know, recitation of the Heart Sutra for contemplation of, I guess, emptiness or sunyata or non-self? Yeah, I, I've never read it, so I don't, know any, I don't know anything about it. I don't really usually read uh, anything apart from the, uh, the four Nikayas. That's kind of what I read. Uh, occasionally, I might read other things, but not very much. Uh, so I can't really say, but it may very well be, uh, yeah, maybe may okay here. Uh, um, I would uh, recommend to take the four Nikayas as your foundational uh, understanding of the Dhamma, and maybe the Heart Sutra can help a little bit, uh, but uh, it's more like a commentary on the early Sutta. That's how I would understand it, uh, and not to be taken as a kind of out of that, outside of that context. Uh, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. We should, we should <laughs> okay. just stick to yeah. the, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. The Heart Sutra is basically the Prajna Paramita Sutra, right? It's kind of a, a short version of that or whatever, yeah. Yeah, exactly.